welcome all those that are joining us by way of the video broadcast. Thank you for joining us at Spirit of Life Church for the preaching of God's Word this morning. So our text is John 14. Um, I think it needs further adjustment. So John 14. So let's read from verse 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Verse 15, if you... If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. I want, I want to stop right there. I know, I know we read, to verse, read up to verse 20, but I, I just want to stop right there. For the purpose of following um, with me this morning, uh, we don't have the opportunity of having our PowerPoint today, so the, 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 um, the scriptures that are going to be spoken this morning um, are not going to be displayed, obviously, and so you'll need to take note, or you can come back to the broadcast and uh, look at it again to get some of the information and some of the scriptures that you didn't, were not quick enough to grab this morning. So the title of my sermon this morning is The Promise of the Paraclete, and, and uh, you will recall from our study and our previous sermons that we've now progressed into that part of John's Gospel where we see Jesus' private ministry. His public ministry, you heard us speak about a few weeks ago, had come to a climatic but tragic end, and Jesus now moves into, the, into a private ministry with his disciples. And let's, let's do a quick recollection of that, a five-second, ten-second recollection. We find that there is, there is the example, as we look back, we find there's the example of humility in love with the, the foot washing. Do you remember that? And then Jesus announces his betrayer. He speaks of Judas. The betrayer is exposed in the presence of the other disciples. And then we find uh, Peter's denial has been foretold. So you can imagine, you can imagine what atmosphere must have been in that room on that night, what the atmosphere must have been like. We can imagine what was going through the minds and the hearts of the disciples as they were hearing Jesus speak on that night. Now Jesus knew that they were worried. He, after all, he knows the thoughts of every man. He knew that they were worried. He knew that they were troubled. And therefore in verse 1 of chapter 14, he says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And I think the preacher did a great job of expounding that last week. So now in, 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 in verse 1 of chapter 14, it begins like this. Let not your hearts be troubled. Did the disciples have reason to be worried? Did the disciples have reason to be concerned? Did, did they have reason to be troubled? Uh, yes, they sure did. After all, after all, their they, they master had revealed some deep truths uh, you know, to them whilst they were journeying with him in his public ministry. And he further went on to reveal deep truths while they were sitting with him in that room. And he will go on further in that night to reveal even more to them, deeper things to them about his need to leave them. And leave them, depart from them, leave them in a troubled world. Make note of that. He's leaving them in a troubled world. And beloved, we live, we live in a troubled world. A world that is fraught with all sorts of difficulties. A world that is bursting at its seams with sickness and disease, with sufferings and turmoils. And even as we don't even have to turn up the news, we're hearing about the, the wars that are going on in this world. So there's a, it's, a, it's, it's a world that is fraught with all sorts of things and Above that, above that, this is a world that is soaked in sin. A world that is cursed with sin. And the life here is filled with all sorts of trials. Trials of every sort. Now instead of pretending like these trials don't exist, 
Instead of pretending like these troubles don't exist, instead of pretending that this world is not sin cursed, the Bible is truthful about the world that we live in. The Bible is clear that man will face hardship in this life. Our dear brother Job was no stranger to suffering and turmoil. He says in Job 14.1, Man is born of woman, is short-lived and full of turmoil. In Jeremiah 20.18, the prophet writes, Why did I come out from the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? During his public ministry, Jesus, knowing that his followers would face hardship in this world, said to them in Matthew 6, 34, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Hmm. And later in John 16, 33, you will hear Jesus say again to his disciples, In the world you have tribulation. Paul and Barnabas in Acts 14, 22 reminded the believers in Asia Minor that through many tribulations, through many tribulations, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Now as we look at this, we find tribulations, sorrows, troubles, turmoil. It all sounds rather dull and gloomy. It sounds like there is no hope. But hold on. There is hope. There is hope. The, Bible, the same Bible that, that tells the truth about the condition of this world, about the troubles that man will face in this world, about the troubles that man will go through, is the same Bible that tells the truth about God's comfort for man in this troubled world. When a sinner man repents of his sin and turns to Christ, he not only receives the gifts of salvation and eternal life, he also receives the promise of God, the promise of God's help and God's comfort for him in this present world. Go with me if you will to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3 to 5. Put your bookmark on John 14 and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3 to 5. And let's read what it says there. Are you there? Getting there? Yes. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to verse 5 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort, can you see that? Who comforts us in all tribulation. Does it say some tribulation? Does it say a few tribulations? It says he comforts us in all our tribulations. Some versions, some versions you might have say afflictions. Comforts us in all our afflictions. So let's read that again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in all tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ ab abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. What is he saying? What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, our God comforts his children because he is compassionate and he is gracious. Now, as I look into that scripture, I'm encouraged. As you look into it today, I pray that you are encouraged. We must be encouraged by God's comfort for us. But listen, God's plan in comfort for you and I runs deeper, runs much deeper. I realize that as I read this, I realize that as I studied the Bible, like that, that, that God's comfort came much earlier. You see, the comfort of God, the comfort of God is already evident in my salvation and in your salvation. When he forgave me of my sin, when he forgave you of your sins, he was already manifesting his comfort towards us. So from the beginning, from the beginning, the life of a believer is filled with the comfort of God. Listen to what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father loved us and gave us eternal comfort. 
Write those words down. Eternal comfort and good hope through grace. That verse speaks of eternal comfort. And that eternal comfort will finally culminate in perfect peace and eternal bliss in heaven as Revelation chapters 7 and 12, sorry, 7 and 21 tell us. Listen, but listen to what Revelation chapter 7 verse 16 to 17 says. Listen to what it says. I'll just pick one. Revelation 7 verse 16 to 17. What does it say about our eternal state? Listen to this. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Hmm. What a glorious picture. A glorious reality for the believer. But what about our life here, Pastor? You know, we speak about, we speak about the future. That is a picture of the future. A, gl- a glorious reality of the future. But what about our time here now before we get to heaven? Well, God not only promises comfort in the future, but comfort in the present time as well. Have we forgotten the words of the psalmist David? Have we forgotten those words of Psalm 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they do what? They comfort me. Further, we go on to read in other places in the book of Psalm, David's acknowledgement of God's comfort in his time of trials, in his time of troubles, in his time of depression. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul also acknowledged God's comfort to those who are depressed. In 2 Corinthians 7, 6, actually speaking about himself, speaking about the depressive state that he often found himself in, found himself in, Paul writes, but God comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And again in 2 Thessalonians 2, 17, Paul encourages us in the work, in the work that we have for our God. In our ministry, he encourages us He says, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and word. Beloved, what do we make of all this? What do we make of all this? Well, we find that God is always concerned for his children. God is always concerned for his church. God is always concerned for the believers in him. If you just take a look at John 14, the upper room, if we just take a look at that text as we, as we focus on what we've learned over the, la- over the past few weeks and we focus on what we're learning here today and over the next few weeks, you will, you will see Jesus' encounter with his disciples and Jesus tells them, He's going to the cross. He's going to die. That's what he tells them. He tells them, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die. As much as the anguish of the cross is at his door, in the next few hours he'll be arrested. He'll be beaten and scourged. In the next few hours he'll be taken to an an illegal court. He'll be mocked and they'll pull on his beard and spit in his face. They'll, they'll put a crown of thorns upon his head and cause him to, to, to carry his own cross. They'll nail his hands and his feet and raise him up into the air. There's the anguish of the cross. And as that lies at his door, Jesus doesn't take time to talk about what he's going to be going through. He doesn't take time to, to focus on what he's going through. What does he do? He spends his time comforting the disciples. Oh, what great love this is. As he was preparing to leave, Jesus sought to comfort his disciples. We see in scripture, dear church, we see very clearly. We must not think that this comfort is only for the disciples. No, it's, it's, it's for the believer today. It's for you and I today as well. 
Our comfort comes from trusting in the promise of God. This morning, your comfort and my comfort comes from our trust in God, our trust in what God said concerning the Holy Spirit, concerning the Helper, and the Greek word there is paraclete. So let's go back and look at John 14, verse 15 to 17 again. John 14, verse 15 to 17. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another Helper, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. From this point on, beloved, and over the next few weeks, we'll be speaking and preaching and teaching concerning the Holy Spirit, and especially in relation to the Holy Spirit being our helper. But before we unwrap that over the next few weeks, let's take a look at verse 15 again. It says, look at verse 15 again. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Can you see that? What does it say? If you love me, who? If you love Jesus. In other words, in other words you've you, you got to manifest that love or our, or our obedience to his word shows our love for God. Our love for God is manifested I'll say that again, our love for God is manifested in our obedience to His commandments, our obedience to His precepts, to His word. Now notice as soon as we get to verse 16, what does it say? As soon as we get to verse 16, we now see Jesus' love for His disciples. So the, the verse before that, we see our love for God in our obedience to His word. Mm -hmm. And then there is Jesus' love for His disciples, His love for His believers. His love for us is expressed by asking the Father to send the Helper, the Holy Spirit. So Jesus stands before God. Here's the picture. Here's Jesus. He stands before God the Father and the disciples. And Jesus asks for the Helper for the disciples. What is the function he's fulfilling right there? What is the function he's fulfilling right there on that night? He's fulfilling the function of the intercessor. He's fulfilling the function of the great high priest, interceding for his disciples, interceding for his church even right now. Let the church rejoice in that. Let the church acknowledge that, that we have a great high priest right now. An intercessor right now. I think we rejoice maybe with an amen. <laughs> now getting to verse 16, we find the word helper. Underline that in your Bible. If you have a smart gizmo, you can highlight it any way you want to. But I want you to look at the word helper. And in the Greek, it's parakletos, which literally means, which literally means to come alongside. To come alongside to help. Parakletos in its, in, its, in, its, in its wider meaning incorporates these words, comforter, counselor, exhorter, intercessor, encourager, and advocate. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is our parakletos, our comforter, our counselor, our exhorter, our intercessor, our encourager, and our advocate. How marvelous is that? Let's look again what Jesus promised. He said, listen to what he said. I will send you another helper. Can you see that in, in the text? Does this mean that the helper will be, will be less than him? Does this mean that the helper will be more than him? No. The helper that he promised is the Holy Spirit. The helper who is exactly like him. A person who could adequately take his place in power and person. Write those two words down. Power and person. One who could adequately take his place in power and in person. Let me put it to you another way. Jesus is the original helper to the disciples. Where do you get that from, Pastor? Well, if you take this down and go home and read it, like I said, we don't have the benefit of the screen today. Uh, but where do you get that from? We get it from John chapter, uh, sorry, 1 John chapter 2 verse 1. And it reads, listen to as I, as I share this with you. My little children, 
I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What do we have? Or who do we have? We have an advocate with the Father. And, and, and who is that advocate with the Father? He goes on to tell us. It is Jesus Christ, the righteous. So Christ is the advocate. Notice the word advocate. He is the advocate. And in the Greek, it is the same Greek word for parakletos. Or the same Greek word parakletos. Not, not for parakletos, but it's the same Greek word parakletos. So Jesus Christ is the original helper, the original parakletos, but now he promises to send another helper. Another helper who is like him. Like Jesus was with them to teach, to direct, to encourage, to strengthen, to comfort them. And, and, and now that he's leaving them, he promises that the Holy Spirit will do the same. But the only difference is he will do it forever. And like Jesus was with them in power, and like Jesus was with them in person, the Holy Spirit will be with them in power and in person. How marvelous is that? Now there's further evidence to prove that. The further evidence comes when you look at the helper there has the nature of Jesus Christ. Now you notice from the text, this underlined in your text, before the word helper is the word another. Can you see that? Another helper. Another helper. Now the word another is used a number of times in the New Testament. This somehow seems to, when somebody reads this, and we see the word another, we seem to think that it's something outside the Godhead. That Jesus was talking about something outside the Trinity. But when you look at it, now the word another is used a number of times in the New Testament. And every time it is used, the Greek word is either one of two words. Either alos, A-L-L-O-S, or heteros, H-E-T-E-R-O-S. It's either alos or heteros. And here in John 14, the word for another is alos, meaning, meaning another, but same in nature. Are you with me right now? It is another, but same in nature. Where do I get that from? In various places uh, in the Bible. For example, in Matthew 13, when Jesus speaks of the parables, he speaks one parable after another, and he, he comes to the end of a parable, and he says another parable, he goes on to speak, and he says another parable, and he goes on to speak. And every time he uses the word another when describing the parable, the Greek word there is alos, which is another but same in nature. In other words, another parable but same in nature as the previous one. And when you look at the context in Matthew 13, he's talking about the kingdom of God. In other words, I'm giving you another parable, but I'm still talking about the kingdom of God. I'm giving you another parable, but I'm still talking about the kingdom of God. Are you with me right now? So when he uses the word another here, another helper, he's talking about another but same in nature. And heteros is another but different in nature. So the word here is not heteros, but alos, which is the same in nature. So we see that the helper, the helper has the same nature as Jesus Christ. Did you get that in three minutes? I hope you did. It's going to help you tremendously. If you need, a, if you need to talk afterwards, by all means approach us to talk. I'm going to, I can explain further. And so, so, so we see that the helper that Jesus speaks of here in John 14 has the same nature as Jesus Christ. He's the same in power, he's the same in person. Now that's important, two important words I told you a, f a few minutes ago, power, person. Like Jesus was with them in power, like Jesus was with them in person, the Holy Spirit is with the disciples, will be with the disciples in power and in person. And like Jesus was with the disciples in power and person, then the Holy Spirit is with his believers today in power and in person. Why is that important to note? Well, uh, uh, it's important to know that, to encourage your faith, to know that God is with you. That's one of the main reasons. But also, it, it helps us to be able to preach the gospel to those who are declaring a false gospel. For example, the Jehovah's Witnesses who's, who say that the Holy Spirit is not a person, but an active force. Now, this is clearly of of a false teaching, a, a, a teaching that has been manipulated to meet a particular goal, a particular end that they want to achieve. And, but 
Scripture clearly reveals that the Holy Spirit possesses the attributes of a personhood. Now, again, I wish I had the screen here, and, and you could gain so much from this, but, but just, just, just listen to this and go back and, and listen to it online, and then you can get all of the, the Scripture references. The Holy Spirit, let's just take a few minutes to do that. The Holy Spirit is a person because the Spirit possesses intellect. The Spirit possesses intellect. He knows the thoughts of God. 1 Corinthians 2.11 tells us that. The Holy Spirit is a person because He possesses emotion. He can be, he can be grieved. Ephesians 5.30, you came across that? But grieving the, the Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, sorry, and Isaiah 63.10 tells us that. He's a person because He possesses will. He distributes gifts to the church as He wills, you remember? In 1 Corinthians 12, 11. He's a person because he possesses the ability to teach, as we will learn later on in John 14, verse 26. We'll cover that over the next few weeks. He's a person because he can testify, as Romans 8, 16 tells us. He's a person because he can lead and direct, as Matthew 4, 1 and Acts 13, 4 tell us. Romans 8, 14 also tells us that. He's a person that can speak, as Acts 29 tells us. He can, con- he can convict, as John 16, verse 7 to 8 tells us. He can intercede, as Romans 8, 26 tells us. Are you getting this? He can reveal, as Mark 12, 36, 1 Corinthians 2, 10, and Acts 1, 16 tells us. Ah, are we developing an idea now? Are, we de- are, you, are you understanding the truth about the Holy Spirit? That the Holy Spirit is a person. These are the attributes of a person. Further to this, further to this, the Bible is clear that there's, there's a great danger in lying to the Holy Spirit or blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Ananias and Sapphira found this out in Acts 5.3. When they lied to the Spirit, when they lied to the Holy Spirit about their land they sold. Now, if the Holy Spirit was not a person of the Godhead and just an active force, as some Christian organizations or so-called Christian organizations say so, then why would the penalty be so severe for lying to the Holy Spirit? Beloved, we must correct those false teachings. We must correct the false teachings about the Holy Spirit and draw people into a genuine salvation in Jesus Christ. And there's far more to this. We cannot even conclude it today. So as we draw near to the closing part of my sermon today, let's look at verse 17 again. What does verse 17 says? It says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him, nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Can you see that? Let's look at the part that talks about the spirit of truth. If you want to highlight that or underline that or write it in your notes, the spirit of truth. Jesus called the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. While Jesus was with his disciples, he ministered truth to them. And in his departure to the Father, the Holy Spirit will continue in power and in person proclaiming that truth. Jesus made sure, he made sure that wherever he went, he spoke the truth about who God is. He spoke the truth about who he was and why he came to earth. And now that he's leaving, the work of the Spirit will be exactly the same in power and person and will proclaim what Jesus was proclaiming. What was Jesus proclaiming? Truth. I think our Pentecostal friends need to learn a little bit about that. The Holy Spirit 
would not only inspire the disciples in truth who went on then to write the New Testament, but would lead all believers, you and I, would lead all believers in truth. There is a great disparity in the, in the charismatic churches. There's a great, there's a massive hole in their theology when you begin to look at how they claim the Holy Spirit works. Because the, the Word and the Spirit don't seem to line up. Oh, this is of the Spirit, you won't understand it. Really? Is the Spirit going to tell you something that is not in line with the Word, the truth? No, it, it goes against his job description. It goes against what he came to do. Imagine if Jesus was walking around somewhere and he saw people falling all over the place and crawling on the floor and barking like dogs and acting all Pentecostal and charismatic and, and all that. Would, would, would Jesus say, I, well, I accept that, that's pretty good? Or would he openly rebuke it and say, no, that is not of God? And so why would the Spirit then approve of something that is not in line are you with me right now <laughs> not in line with what the word says so pentecostal charismatic word of faith people detach themselves from the truth and let me just say this and we've covered this in our we've covered this in our our, our daily devotional over the last few weeks when we when we when we spoke of blasphemy when we, when we covered it under the 10 commandments Really to say that the Spirit is doing something that the Spirit is not even responsible for is blasphemy. Spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit is with us to lead us all, to lead believers in truth. Then we hear Jesus say, look, if you look a bit further on in your text, we hear Jesus say, the world cannot receive what? Truth. Because it neither sees him nor knows him, the Holy Spirit. The world cannot receive truth because it neither sees or knows the Holy Spirit. Beloved, we must be clear. Ungenerate people, <laughs> ungenerate people cannot, I repeat, cannot comprehend spiritual truth. Paul confirms this in 1 Corinthians 2.14. You will remember he says, A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Have you come across that scripture? So why did Jesus put that part in? Why did Jesus include that in John 14? Why did Jesus put that part about the world not receiving the truth? Here's the answer. It was a caution to the disciples. He was cautioning them that in the advance, in their advance as disciples, as they, as they take his work forward, despite having the Holy Spirit work in them and through them, they will still face hostility. They will still face rejection. They will still face an unbelieving world. Does that help us today? Does that help me today? Does that help you today? It sure does. Because we're commanded to go out and to, and to save the Lord. We're commanded to go out and preach the gospel to the world. And the Holy Spirit is working in us and, and through us. And, and, we, and, and Jesus encourages his disciples and said, even though the Spirit will work in you and through you, you will still face hostility. You will still face rejection. You will still face an unbelieving world. I take comfort from that today. Then we get to the part where it says, you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Can you see that? What a glorious thing this is for the church to understand. The Holy Spirit is with us. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. How marvelous. What a glorious thing that is to have the Holy Spirit not only with us, but in us. Hmm. Jesus says to his disciples and to us believers today that the world 
will not know the Holy Spirit, but His disciples will. His disciples will because, because, because the Holy Spirit will not only be with them, but will indwell them. The Holy Spirit will not only be with us, but will indwell us. Now let me point out that here that Jesus promises, or Jesus has promised that the Holy Spirit will indwell the disciples does not mean that the Holy Spirit was not at work in the past. When I say the past, I mean in the time of the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. Does not mean that the Holy Spirit was not at work before the outpouring at Pentecost. I know our study has not taken us deeper into the Old Testament, but time will come when we will go through Genesis. We will go through the Old Testament. We're not at that stage at the moment, but time will come. And and as, as we study the Old Testament, you will find that the work of the Spirit is evident in the Old Testament. On the subject of the Spirit's work, John MacArthur writes this, and I quote, No one in any era of redemptive history could be saved, sanctified, empowered for service and witness, or be guided in the understanding of Scripture and praying in the will of God, apart from the Holy Spirit's internal work, unquote. So this is very much the the Spirit's involvement in the Old Testament. The Old Testament saints had to be regenerated by the Spirit to experience their spiritual blessing. So how do we harmonize the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Covenant and in the New Covenant? Well, I guess Haggai 2.5, and, and again, if we, you need to take note and just uh, go back home and read it for yourself. Haggai 2.5 gives us the best way to answer that question, and I, let me read, and you listen. Listen for a moment. It says, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst, and I want you to uh, take note of the word midst. As we look at that, my spirit remains in your midst, fear not. From Haggai 2 5, one theologian concludes the spirit dwelt with the Old Testament saints through the community, but would not be in them individually and and intimately. Under the Old Covenant, The Spirit was present with the believers in a general sense. But soon, soon as Christ promised his disciples, the the Comforter would be in an unprecedented way, personally and permanently indwelling all those who believed. So as we come to a close, let me ask this question. Jesus knew it was going to be a troubling, a troubled world. He knew that his disciples will face trials of every sort. He knew his disciples will be troubled at every hand, persecuted, struck down, imprisoned, put in chains, mocked. He knew that his church would go through all sorts of trials and tribulations. Why didn't he take his disciples with him? He said, I'm going, why don't you, let me take you with me. I have space. I'll take you with me. Why didn't he take his disciples with him? Why didn't he take them out of this troubled world to a place where there is no trouble? The fact that you and I are here today in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ is the reason why Jesus did not rescue his disciples from this troubled world. They became the witness of God. They became the testimony of God. They became the evangelists of God, the ministers of God in this troubled world. So beloved in Christ, as I end with this, let me just say this right now. The purpose of the helper, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is not so that we can just have a better job. The purpose of the Spirit is not so that we can just have a better home or to just feel good inside. The purpose of the Holy Spirit was given so that the unique power could be made available to every believer from the disciples' time to today and in the future that every believer may be empowered for the sake of the gospel. 
That every believer may be empowered for the sake of the gospel, for the gospel meaning evangelism and ministry. For the purpose of building the church, for the ministry of the church, and for the purpose of reaching the lost. God is faithful to his word. God is faithful to his word. What Jesus promised to his disciples during his earthly ministry, he was faithful to fulfill that. What his disciples and what he promised his disciples and all believers through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is faithful to fulfill. This is our blessed assurance. This is our blessed assurance that God is faithful to his word. Shall we pray?